So yes, I expect people to despair. I mean, it's horrifying. It's horrible. Dealing with, with our own death is difficult enough in this yes. death-denying culture. Mm -hmm. But to deal with everybody's death, that's a heavy load. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Junea Donaldson. Late in 2012, we watched a video by Guy McPherson about climate chaos. I was stunned. And I immediately called Guy to see if he could talk with us, and I'm glad he's here today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show, Junea. Guy is um, the Professor Emeritus of Natural Resources and the Environment at University of Arizona for 20 years, and a conservation biologist and an author of 13 books, including Walking Away from Empire and Going Dark. Um, and your blog is Nature Bats Last. We'll catch up on those things. So thank you. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. You've, I see you as an independent scientist at this point, not being beholden to a university, to an organization, to money, to the government. Having taken on a rather daunting Paul Revere-like calling to bring together the data, the on climate chaos that we aren't seeing or it's hidden away from the mainstream. Tell us what most of us don't get to see. Well, I was 20 years in active service at the University of Arizona and I left about five years ago. Hmm. And subsequently that has liberated me to pursue information in ways I didn't have time or cultural incentive, we'll say, to pursue when I was in active service. There, there's a lot of self-censorship that goes on in this society, and it, it happens at universities too. Imagine that. <laughs> so, of course, I didn't have time, interest, inclination to pursue the kinds of information I've been pursuing since then. It was 2002, I was editing a book with a colleague on climate change, and I reached the conclusion that we were headed for human extinction. 2030 or so wow. and there was no good reason for that we certainly didn't have the, the data the models the information no. so I suppose it was largely intuitive and then a year or so later I discovered the concept of global peak oil and I realized that it's a Hail Mary pass that <laughs> the set of living arrangements might go away in time to prevent our own demise in the near term. Well, that was a long time ago. Hmm. And, hmm. and civilization has not been terminated, has no, not and, ended. And so it just keeps going and going and going. And, and so now we've triggered 30 self-reinforcing feedback loops, positive feedbacks. So, um, uh, an informed analysis of one of those indicates that we're looking at 4C temperature rise above the beginning of the Industrial Revolution by 2030, and, and 10C by 2040. And that's just one. That's methane being released out of the Arctic Ocean. There are 29 others. And you, you multiply all those together, and they're multiplicative, not additive. You multiply all those together, and it looks like that we, we might indeed not have long as, as a species on this planet. That's not, I mean, that's what stunned me. It's like you can't wrap your head around near term, that near term, human and not just human extinction, um, is inconceivable. It's like it's unthinkable. It, and, and, and we'll talk later about how, how does one respond to that, you know, from the inside. The question, a question that I have for you is can you, obviously, obviously you do long presentations and you've also got an evergreen document where you're keeping track of, of studies, data, and, and my, I noticed that a year ago you had maybe 15 or 16 on that list. And just in this one year, more factors that are, I mean, it's just seems to be going exponential with more and more data coming in. That's right. We, we triggered the, the, the first self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in the scientific community, in the mainstream scientific community, was methane leaking out of the Arctic Ocean. Okay. 
in March 2010, as reported in Science. That was the only self-reinforcing feedback loop reported in 2010. 2011, there were four more. 2012, there were six more. 2013, 16 more. Wow. And so far, here on February 23rd, 2014, we know about one additional one. And we know a lot more about those earlier ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the science is starting to catch mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. with reality, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, we're starting to s accrue evidence about each one of those self-reinforcing feedback loops. And, and you're right, a year ago there were a dozen or so. I delivered a presentation uh, outside of Amsterdam in early August of last year. So, what, l less than six months ago. Yeah. And we were at 19. And now we're at 30. Which is inconceivable. Geological events are playing out in real time at this point. Can you give our viewers some highlights from what you're presenting so that they can get you know, a sense of the data um, that's, that's telling us this? Yes. Well, we know that it's 40 years from cause to effect, 40 years from greenhouse gas emissions until temperature rise. Uh -huh. So okay. the temperature rise we're seeing today is a result of emissions in 1974. Okay. All and right. so, so that, there's a couple of things that are important about that. One, we are not going to slow down this train. The emissions from the last 40 years have not caught up to us. In fact, we have emitted more greenhouse gas emissions in the last 29 years than in the previous 236 years combined. That those 29 years, they're, they're not even baked in yet. Right, right, right. I mean, they're baked into the cake, but they're unaccounted for at the level of the temperature. Okay. Another really important facet of that is that emissions from 40 years ago are being exhibited with temperature rise today. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't feel particularly guilty for things I was doing 40 years ago when I was 13 years old. Yeah, I, I didn't know, and, uh, and as almost no individuals in the society knew where we were headed 40 years ago and thought relevant action would have something to do with terminating industrial civilization. Right. I think that there's also a lot of unintended consequences that we, we don't know. We, we're clever, mm -hmm. as you, you know, clever apes and, and like to experiment and so that oozing black stuff that came out of the ground, um, what might it do? Here we are. Well, yeah, it's incredibly attractive. I mean, and it's fun and it's interesting and it's... Well, of going after of that course. technology and burning those fossil fuels and, and it makes life wonderful of course. in the short term of course. for us individuals. Of course. So, so we've got the temperature lag going to accumulate mm -hmm. and hit us, I mean, mm -hmm. increasingly every year, right? That's right. And there are other feedback loops as well, other things that are... Um, what, what I think you said here is we are on course to be at you tell me, a higher level number of degrees C warming planetarily, even by 2030 or 2040. Well, yes, uh, based on a single feedback, mm. that of methane released from the Arctic. And methane is coming out of the Antarctic, and methane is being released from the permafrost, or the permamelt, as we really should properly call mm -hmm. it now. Mm -hmm. And just, just one source, methane from the Arctic, from the seaflow in, in the Arctic, leads us to 4C uh, a temperature beyond which humans have ever existed on this planet. That's what I was going to ask you. It's By like 2030. 4C doesn't sound like a lot, because, you know, it's the difference right. between, say, Alaska and L.A., but, but why is that humans have never existed at that hot a planet? We haven't existed at 3.5C above baseline, above the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Why? Because all kinds of weird things start happening when you heat up the temperature to a certain amount. So when we came out of the Ice Age, out of, out of the uh, Pleistocene into the Holocene, the temperature warmed a couple of degrees C, and that temperature rise, which subsequently stabilized, probably accounts for our ability to develop civilization. Civilizations hmm. arose several places around the globe hmm. at about the same time, a few thousand years ago. Okay. Probably because the temperature became stable and warm enough to grow grains. Okay. So that's, that's a hallmark of civilization, is the ability to grow grains and then store them, mm -hmm. and therefore control the food and get you through the, through the hard winters and so on. Yes. And 
So if civilization was locked in, and I'm not sure it was, but it's been locked in now for a few thousand years, then industrial civilization is just a step further, <laughs> one more step towards that convenience of having stuff we like. Right, right. And so here we are, sort of unwilling participants mm. in this system that takes us to the abyss and that almost nobody knows we're even headed for the abyss. Right, uh, which is what we're talking. I want to go back to you saying a lot of things can happen at that, you know, as we get beyond the three and a half degree C, like. Right, like, well, we're already seeing at 0.85 C above baseline. We're already seeing polar vortex. That's where we are now, 0.85 above? Yes. That's all. Yes. And, and the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases warned us about exceeding 1C in 1990. They said that's truly dire and catastrophic. And James Hansen has, has joined that party just within the last couple of weeks. Mm. He switched from 2C being truly catastrophic to 1C. is, is going to do serious damage. Well, I think we're, we're already done. It, if 1C was the target, then 0.85C is close enough that it's taken us right. Over, right. The, over the cliff, as it were. What kinds of things do we see from that? Well, we see high temperatures locally high temperatures that, that are sufficient to cause proteins to denature and therefore kill plants. Mm. Well, There goes agriculture. Yes. Bingo. In addition, you see temperature swings that are so severe. Here's an example. I lived in Tucson, Arizona for more than 20 years. Two of the last four winters have been so cold that 80 to 100-year-old citrus trees died in Tucson, Arizona, two Tucson. of the last four years in Tucson because the, <coughs> the jet stream is meandering mm -hmm. far greater than it used to be because mm -hmm. the, the, the temperature gradient has broken down between the Arctic and the Amazon, between mm -hmm. the Arctic and the equator. So now that jet stream, which used to blow across Canada and the northern United States with these, with these cold fronts, and they'd, they'd sweep across the country in four or five days and be done with it. Now, we have the jet stream meandering with this huge amplitude and dragging cold, cold temperature from the Arctic yes, yes, down to Mexico yes. City and destroying all the vegetable production for winter vegetables as far south as Mexico City. So those are the kinds of things that are going to lead to our extinction as a species. Are these extreme temperature events, including extreme high temperatures that denature proteins, and temperature swings, including cold temperatures, that kill land plants. In addition, we're acidifying the ocean to such an mm. extent mm. that mm. we're killing the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are the base of the marine food web. Okay. Without phytoplankton, without significant numbers of phytoplankton, we don't get any food from the ocean. We might have jellyfish, a few. <laughs> Doesn't sound real appetizing. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. not at all. So what you're saying, if I hear you right, is that um, what, what's going to lead toward that extinction of humans primarily is the destabilization of, of, of the environmental factors for food growing. That's going to be a, a really, really big one. Now, where I live, in the southwestern interior of a large continent in the northern hemisphere, the most rapid place to warm up, probably what will happen is the temperature will rise to 130 or 135 degrees Fahrenheit one of these days. It's not, not that great a difference right. over the historical record. Mm and that will denature the proteins in all the plants, and so all the plants will die. And then the wind will start blowing, and we'll have the dust bowl that never ends. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. me and my neighbors and everybody who lives there will literally choke to death. Mm -hmm. If they don't die from the food, they'll die from the inability from to the breathe. And breathing. There are thousands of people who died in the dust bowl mm -hmm. in the 1930s because they, they were breathing in more solid matter than air. So is there anything else um, on, the, on the story of the factors leading towards extinction that you want to share here? Well, there, there are a couple of things that I think are pretty important. There's this contrarian view that the temperature has stabilized within the last 15, now 16 years. Mm -hmm. 1998 was the hottest global temperature year. And so that's based on land surface records. But as it turns out, a paper from about a year ago points out in geophysical research letters, points out that heating has actually accelerated. It's just been hidden in the oceans. Uh -huh. So the oceans are heating up. Well, the oceans, as you know, 
account for over two-thirds of the surface area of the planet. We just have our, our thermometers on land, so we missed this. So it's just the, the oceans are soaking it up, getting more acidified, and who knows what else. Yes, you know, and also getting a lot hotter in ah. addition to being, being more acidified. So what that does is it releases methane, for example, from the, from the Arctic Ocean. So we can, we can take a look mm. from a couple of weeks ago at methane concentrations in the atmosphere, and you can see they're, they're concentrated in the northern hemisphere. These, this dark red is a lot of methane. At the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution, we experienced about 700 parts per million, parts per billion, rather, 700 parts per billion methane in the atmosphere. We're now at routinely over 2,000, global average, 2,000 parts per billion. And, and last week, um, well, earlier this week, just a couple of days ago, we were at about 2,400 parts per billion in some recording stations. So that is changing the atmosphere. Is that is it about changing the atmospheric composition, or is it just about the heating? I mean, what well, is well, that, that's a result of heating, right? Releasing the methane into yeah. the atmosphere. And methane is more than a hundred times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide in the short term, in mm -hmm. less than twenty years. So every every part per billion of methane in the atmosphere is a really really big deal, and so that leads to acceleration. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, these self-reinforcing feedback loops, they self-reinforce. It's warmer, or the methane emerges. Or the methane emerges, it gets warmer. It gets warmer, or the methane comes out. Runaway. Yes. That's, that's runaway and non-linear. Yes. Are things that you're saying, this is like, it's a complex system, all kinds of things tying together, but it's on runaway. That's right. And, and this, this runaway event is the sort of thing James Hansen worried about in his book, Storms of My Grandchildren, and, and didn't think it would happen in the near term. But that book came out long before we knew about these 30 self-reinforcing feedback loops, and, and we had evidence that we had triggered them. So the acceleration is astonishing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's boggling. I mean, we've been, I've been keeping an eye on it since 19... Actually, 76, but 1990 more so, when I read McKibben's End of Nature. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me like the last two or three years, it's like, it it's, it's feels exponential to me. Well, I, I update regularly an essay on my website, Nature Bats Last, the, the climate update and summary essay, and I updated it again this morning, and I have to update it every few days because the information just keeps just coming pouring in. in, and I ran across... Two more journal articles that came out within the last few days. One and two. it's never any good news. No, I, I noticed that. <laughs> it's like nobody is saying, oh, it's not as bad. Tell us then, tell us about this piece. So planetary scientists for a long time assumed and, and reported that Earth was in the middle of the habitable zone for a, for a star the size of our sun. So that's, that's the sun. Here's... Earth, and we, th we thought we were right in the middle of this green zone, the habitable zone. It turns out um, a, a paper in Astrophysical Journal um, last year, March, points out that actually Earth is right on the inner edge of the habitable mm. zone, which indicates that if we change the atmosphere ever so slightly, we could push ourselves out of the habitable zone. We could push ourselves towards Venus, which is you know, toward the sun a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So Mars, Earth, Venus, about equidistant. Venus is not shown on this figure. Venus is right there. Well, it turns out that we have not changed our atmosphere a little bit. We changed it a lot. And we were barely, barely, we were within 1% of being uninhabitable. And so we've, we've now altered the atmosphere to such an extent that I can't even imagine that we, that we have not triggered runaway as a result of that large change in atmospheric chemistry. And in a planet that was very close to the mm -hmm. to close to the edge anyway. Zone anyway. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. I mean, what you're saying is, there are people who say, "Well, mm. civilization go down, humans may go down, but some part, the Earth will survive." And what you're saying here is, not necessarily. That's right. Life may not continue on this that's, planet. That's right. Because of this one because species. Because, as we know, Venus went Venus. Yeah. And and if we look at an exponential, uh, an analysis done by Malcolm Light. Um, December of last year, where he actually applies an, an exponential function to methane release and in the Arctic and consequently temperature rise. 
he takes us to, to temperatures similar to Venus in 2096. That's this century. I want to so we're not going to do well in that sort of environment. Uh, I, I, th I think that's true, and that's staggering. I mean, it's mm -hmm. something that, how do we, how do you, when you first had that intuition and began gathering the data and it began to just validate what your intuition was, mm -hmm. I mean, how did you take that? You know, I'm talking about how do you, how do you respond inside to this? Poorly. You know, I was... I was much younger than I am now, for one thing, and and I I, I mourned obviously mm -hmm. for our species, and it was it was strange because people couldn't understand that it's such an abstract concept. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a conservation biologist, and extinction is not merely an abstract concept to me, because I've been documenting documenting the demise of other species for a mm -hmm. long time, and so it's not just abstract. But people couldn't understand why I would have so little empathy for their dying 85-year-old grandmother who had a full and rich life and seven children. But I was mourning this other thing that they can't even wrap their minds around. And that was not the first thing that made me a um, social outcast, shall mm -hmm. we say? <laughs> but it was yet another indicator that I was thinking a little differently than other people. So I mourned for months, and nobody even noticed. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to deal with that, a really, really long time, in mm -hmm. part because I didn't seek therapy for it, and, mm -hmm. and, and probably nobody would have, no therapist would have understood any sure, of what I was sure, going through because sure. it's so unusual, it's so strange. Um, and then a, a, a llama in Winnipeg, Llama Jerry, saw a four-minute film clip uh, shot by uh, Pauline Schneider, who's making a movie about my efforts. And in this four minutes, he said, it became obvious that I had reached a, a point of acceptance. That up until that point, I had been angry, mm -hmm. confused, lashing out, frustrated. I was experiencing all these emotions. And then he said, in October of 2013, you finally let go. And you became a much more centered human being. He said, I saw that. And, and, I, and his response was, I have to get him up here. We need to talk. Mm. Does that match your experience of yourself? What yes. he what he named there? Yes. Yeah. So yes. you moved. I, I didn't have any identifier, tag, no mm -hmm. moniker mm -hmm. to put on it. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. just knew I was a different human being than I was weeks earlier. And part of that was because I realized that it's not my fault. Uh, you know, as a lifelong teacher, I assumed that it was my job to teach everybody in the world what they need to do. And of course I was the teacher, so of course they would listen to me and they would do what I told them. <laughs> I, I mean, and it's not your fault that the IPCC and the, all the governments of the world and that all the people of the world don't hear this and get it. Right. And it took a long time. Mm. I, I had to walk, a, walk away from teaching and spend nearly five years away from it to realize that I, I can't change the world. Mm. It's all I can do to change myself, and not necessarily in a good way. And so I need to let go of this notion that I can, you know, with a, with a pair of tights and a, and a cape, save the world. I can't, and I don't even have the tights or the cape. And so that made me a lot more relaxed about it. Also, you know, the 40-year lag between cause and consequence um, is yet another piece that mm -hmm. says, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. You know, 40 years ago, we didn't know. You didn't know. Right. Right. And so, so we're trapped. So let go or be dragged. And, and so finally I did. Interestingly, this llama, his teacher had all of his students as one of their final lessons, watch a body decompose. And so he told me that, and he said, you've been watching the body decompose. You've been watching the body yes. decay for a long time. Yes, yes. So finally, you've reached this understanding of impermanence. Mm. Mm. And awesome analogy. I, I learned so much when I spent a few days Big. with him and his, his Dharma Center group. So when you present this information to audiences, and I'm sure that people are also, you know, rocked by, mm -hmm. deeply moved mm -hmm. by this possibility that not only, that, it, that it's happening on our watch, that we're looking at the, 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 the end story on our watch, likely, and that the young people of today, what kind of future are they going to be, you know, it was already up in uncertainty and it's even more uncertain. What kinds of 
what will I say, uh, advice or perspectives do you give people about how do we live through this? Well, I, I frequently point out the, the line from Edward Abbey, the iconoclastic writer from Tucson. <laughs> Action <laughs> is the antidote to despair. So yes, I expect people to despair. I mean, it's horrifying. It's horrible. Dealing with, with our own death is difficult enough in this yes. death-denying culture. Mm -hmm. But to deal with everybody's death? That's a heavy load. And every animal you know, and every bird you right. know, and every fish that is, and a lot more. Right, yes. Everything It's living. Yes. We're destroying every aspect of the living planet. And that's horrifying and grief-inducing if you care, if you have any empathy at all. Yeah. And so what to do? What to do about that? Well, we could crawl in a corner and do nothing. Mm -hmm. And, or, or we could just continue with business as usual. And that's what mm -hmm. most people do when mm -hmm. they, when they, yeah. their takeaway from my message is, well, we're all going down anyway, so I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. Even if it is a job I hate, because I feel like I need to, to earn some money and save for retirement that will never come and all that. And so the advice I give is to, to let go. To, the action is the antidote to despair. So let's do something. If you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, then do. In fact, I think this is incredibly liberating. Yeah. If, if this is the end, then why don't you not do what culture screams at you to do? Mm -hmm. Why don't you do something mm -hmm. different instead? Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly liberating because we don't have to be bound to culture anymore. If, if we're the last human beings to occupy the planet, and I strongly suspect we are, then why don't we exhibit some humanity for a change? And maybe an exalted kind of humanity, if you will, at our best. You know, giving the kind of compassion, the, the random acts of kindness, as you say, um, go and liberate a stream, you know, find, find what we love, you say. It's, yes. a, it's a good one. Find what we love or where we love or who we love and, and serve that. Yes. Know, share it. Yes. So when, when, I, when I see and read about people in hospice, mm -hmm. and I think we're all in hospice now, when I see the actions of those people, I don't see money grubbing. I don't see people accumulating shoes. I see people giving things away. I see people acting with the kindness and, com and compassion for which humans are renowned yeah. and in which we respect in human beings. And so I think that's great. These are people who are, who are accepting mm -hmm. their own deaths and integrating it fully. And how do they act? They don't act like the banksters on Wall Street. They pursue love. They do what they love. They pursue lives of excellence. Let's mm. do that. I suspect we get to see the end of this movie. And nobody else in human history has got to see the end of the movie. And they walked out. They left. The power went out. Whatever. They didn't get to see the end. We get to see the end. We get to see how humans act in the face of their own demise. What could be more exciting than that? What could be more humane than that? What a call to the best mm -hmm. in all of us. Right. Thank you. Thank you. The call to the best in all of us. That's what a peak moment is. Join us next time. I'm with Guy McPherson. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Thanks for watching.